video assets. We also own our own education news site called Ed Circuit. So that's enough about me. I'd like to introduce uh, the folks on the panel. To my left is Phil Cantillo, and Phil is a marketing communications executive. Um, he has had 19 years on the agency and client side with companies like BBDO, UPS, and J. Walter Thompson. Um, he's a specialist in global integration and messaging development, and he's now in a role as client partner of Global Marketing Solutions at Facebook. So welcome, Phil. Thank you. And then also to Phil's left is Paul Kuhn. He's also an education industry veteran. He has worked places such as Solution Tree, eChalk, BrainPop, and Tutor.com. Um, his focus is really on helping brands with marketing, sales, communication, um, analytics, and so forth. He's a consultant with his own company, which is called U Marketing and More. So please join me in welcoming uh, the panelists today. So just to sort of get started, um, how many people in here, just a show of hands, would feel very confident in raising their hand to say that they handle world-class communications and engagement? World-class, show of hands, brave. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> so no one. Um, it's, a, it's a tough nut to crack. And I think it's a, it's a game that's changing very rapidly. Um, excuse me. Uh, if you don't have some sort of a strategy to engage not just your customers, but your prospective customers, what's happening? If you're not out there, someone else is, right? It's your competitors that are really doing all the talking and the engagement. So what we're going to talk about are some of the things that we've discovered in our career. Um, again, um, Paul and I from the education industry, but Phil also from his work on the agency side and working at Facebook. And hopefully we can give you some takeaways that you, know, you can apply to your businesses as soon as possible. So I guess the thing that I'd start off with for the, for the panel is could you just give from your perspectives the importance of just being out there and what that really means, um, starting with a social media perspective at first. Yeah, sure, I'll, I'll take a first crack at it. And Paul, feel free to, to, to build. Um, so just a, a quick sort of addition to my background, I'm relatively new to the world of Facebook and um, I think my recent experience sort of joining an organization like that might be helpful for, for the room and, and the challenges that you guys are all facing. Um, I worked in, uh, most recently, a large, what they'd consider a more traditional advertising agency, um, where we would develop communications across a range of channels, including uh, social, uh, but it was probably not a space that my company considered themselves to be true experts in. And increasingly in my career, I was recognizing uh, how important it would be to go get more steeped in uh, really understanding how to work in the social space. And I think that for a lot of people, including a lot of our clients, there's um, some anxiety that comes with that, um, a sense of who's really um, well-grounded in social and, and the most sort of current application and, and companies that are not quite ready to engage at a, at a great level of depth. Um, and so for me personally, taking a, a role at Facebook was an opportunity to, to sort of learn at a much greater level from an inside perspective uh, and to really get uh, a little bit smarter about the kinds of tools that Facebook is building for its uh, clients and for individuals. And I think one of the things I've learned pretty quickly is that fundamentally, um, the sort of day-to-day -day interaction that almost all of us probably have with social media does actually um, make you every bit as qualified uh, as, a, as a business practitioner to at least recognize core principles about how to use these tools uh, and when they're right for your communication needs. And I think what I mean by that is um, we, um, there are so many different social media channels out there and I think some of the challenge that people face is trying to decide which tools make sense uh, for what they're trying to communicate and when to apply them. And it's very easy, with, easy to get overwhelmed with the notion that you might have you know, six or seven different platforms that you want to utilize and that you have to constantly be um, building content for those platforms and building uh, a communication strategy on how to utilize them. But I think so much of what you can be effective in, in sort of moving from maybe zero to you know, 50 miles an hour is the idea of uh, just biting off a little bit at a time and um, trying to be very deliberate about what you're doing uh, with each platform you take on. So just for example, uh, Facebook is an organization that increasingly is trying to create this notion of um, discovery and everything we're putting together. 
so when you spend time on your Facebook newsfeed every day, the kinds of content that we're increasingly putting on newsfeed from the people that you care about just by virtue of your, your friends and your own friend group, and then uh, content from brands that have paid money to be on your newsfeed, as well as publishers who are increasingly putting content there, is creating this new sort of mixture of daily relevant content. And more and more what Facebook is trying to do is fulfill that idea that Facebook becomes your first stop to take in the kind of content that matters to you. And so personal relevance is going to be a very big filter for um, what content matters, what you should be putting there, and then the content you'll want to engage in from other people, other brands, etc. So if you sort of put on your own hat as a marketer and practitioner in your businesses, it's really the very same principle in terms of why Facebook might make sense in your business arsenal. And you can apply that same sort of mentality when you're thinking about engaging on Twitter, perhaps, or uh, Pinterest. Just recognize the core proposition of a platform like that. What does it try to do very well, and how are they building tools to support that core proposition? And you can bite off a little bit at a time to um, try and improve and augment what you're doing across other channels to, to market your business. So that, I think, is sort of one approach that uh, I encourage a lot of people to think about is don't let the sort of scope and scale of these platforms be intimidating. Uh, try and get very focused on why you're using them uh, and build the right kind of content to live up to your core marketing objectives within those platforms. So. Paul, from the education industry, what's your perspective on that? I think that um, presence is still really important. It's just that the mix um, that you might apply to it has changed. It's not that direct mail or in-person visits to districts or trade shows are dead, but that's where you used to need to be to make sure people knew you were still alive and clicking along and where you might get leads. Um, but those can also be very expensive channels. And if we think about how each of us as consumers at the end of the day buy something, whether it's real estate or a washing machine or a car, we're going online. And it is strange to me how we still think our customers are not. <laughs> but um, we have a real opportunity to do more online. Um, and it's not free, but it can be a lot more low cost and it can be a lot more scalable. I think to Phil's point, you don't want to do a lot crappily, which is very easy to get into. <laughs> You want to do less and do it deeper. Um, so in terms of you know, what social media channels make the most sense for you, um, you know, how do you tap into this network where people are trying to go for daily relevant news? I know I use Twitter to stay on top of marketing and sales trends as well as education and ed tech trends. And there's lots of educators, both at an administrator and a teacher level, that refer to their Twitter following as their professional learning network. It's this idea of PD that is you know, on demand. It doesn't relate to their credentialing process or their licensure, which kind of stinks, but it's where they're going for information. And if you can be part of that conversation in a very unsalesy way, which is not always easy, then you have a real opportunity to build mind share. It's, I think that building presence in social is sort of like a, if you think about email nurturing and email opt-in being very hot a few years ago and still very relevant, this is the tier before that. You don't know who they are beyond them following you, but it's a great opportunity to build branding among them in a way that will eventually, hopefully, influence sales and word of mouth kind of leveraging that word of mouth that always works in person, but making it work online even more. I, th yeah. I think that Rob Macabelli really, um, I think he, he nailed it when he talked about this morning. How could you sort of engage people who maybe aren't your customers yet to help you build the right kind of product? I mean, think of the power of that. I mean, he, I think he really hit the nail on the head. I happened to do the exact same thing um, years ago when I was in my other position building a product some of the best features and enhancements that we created were based on Twitter interactions. Not that my company had as a brand Twitter account, but I had as an individual. So if I can lend you any you know, advice from my own perspective is, you know, it's not just your brand, it's also the thought leaders within your organization. It can be a really powerful thing if you're passionate about what you do. Um, it, and you can speak the language of education, which is absolutely critical. But if you can engage people in what kind of a product they're looking for, and certainly you have to filter all of that, but if you can really get some good engagements there, you not only can you, you build a great product, but you can build some amazing relationships going forward. Um, but I want to go back to one of the things that Phil was talking about, just what's the right channel? Is it Twitter? Is it Facebook? Is it Pinterest? Um, or Instagram being part of Facebook? And I'd love to get the perspective from both of you on that. Yeah. Um, absolutely. Um, and just before I forget, one other point that Paul made I thought is really important is a trend that we're seeing. Um, so I spend a lot of my time right now working with um, uh, large clients that are devoting uh, increasing amounts of their advertising dollars to Facebook. 
But one of the big conversations we have with uh, a lot of those uh, teams is the idea that two or three years ago, so many people believed that the, the way to sort of maximize their effectiveness on Facebook was to build a lot of content and try and focus on uh, engaging content for the sake of growing a fan base. And part of that was under the, the notion that the bigger the fan base, uh, the more you were essentially taking advantage of the, the Facebook algorithms to get that content in front of lots of people without necessarily having to spend a, a lot of money to be there. And it's absolutely true that one thing that's changed in the last couple of years at Facebook is that they're not necessarily able to extend that um, organic or unpaid content to quite as many people as they were um, you know, just a few years before by virtue of how much competition there is for the real estate of our newsfeed. And so um, we encourage brands to think about picking their spots about when they're going to maybe promote an important product or a new release uh, or something that's just essentially mission critical and to, to recognize that that's an opportunity to put more paid advertising support behind it. But even though that might seem frustrating to some people who had come to rely on the notion that they were essentially getting a, a great platform uh, with broad reach uh, for you know, comparatively little spend, what Facebook does bring to the party now for so many marketers is um, a really impressive sort of targeting capability. And what's great about Facebook is we have, there are over 1 billion, you know, the number is somewhere around 1.7 billion people using Facebook. So that's an, a ridiculously large sort of scale, but there's an ability to get highly personalized within that audience and to target down to very specific geo locations, down to very specific uh, demographic uh, information uh, or sort of categories, and then even uh, people's interests and um, the things that they care about. So you can quickly take that scale down to a level that is um, hugely relevant to who and, and you know, the people that you need to reach and then becomes infinitely more cost effective. So that tends to balance out that sort of tension point about the idea that you may not be necessarily generating the same level of um, organic reach. But just getting back to Don's question, I think the um, simple answer is um, try and identify at any given time what your, your core mission is, whether it's um, you know, we talk a lot about Pinterest as being a platform to take advantage of people's um, aspirations. And so that's a place to go get inspired by um, content and ideas. Um, Twitter, we talk a lot about um, recognizing how powerful a tool it is for uh, trending information and sort of real-time information. Um, if there were such a thing as a social newswire, it certainly feels like Twitter does that job maybe better than any other platform. Um, in our world at Facebook and Instagram, we talk a lot about that idea of discovery, as I mentioned a few minutes ago. Instagram maybe takes that piece a little bit of a step further in terms of how we've been very focused on the visual environment. Uh, so first it was photography for a few years, now we're in, uh, incorporating video in as well. Uh, it's still a platform about uh, discovery and sharing, uh, it just has that sort of strong focus on um, concise visual and or um, uh, video based storytelling. Uh, but, but relevance, as I mentioned earlier, is also another key uh, factor. What we believe at Facebook is that we're generating not just uh, a lot of varied content for people, but it's the kind of content that really matters to them, that's going to be engaging and important to them on a daily basis. Uh, and then if you even go a couple steps further, there's platforms like there's Tumblr that does a very specific thing for people in terms of the nature of content they want to share, platforms like Snapchat where you're starting to reach very specific ends of a demographic. So just taking the time to do a little bit of homework about what those platforms seem to do particularly well. Uh, and again, picking and choosing your spots about not trying to do everything at once and not trying to do too much on any one platform would probably be some of the biggest um, guidances we would give a lot of people. And Paul, with the education brands that you've been working with, what do you see them? Is it, is it Facebook? Is it Twitter? What, what are they using? I think that Facebook, um, it reaches a lot of us in our daily life. You might not be doing your job while you're on there, so that could be debated, whereas people have used Twitter in a more professional way as well. Certainly the visual capabilities of Facebook, even with Twitter's advance, advances, um, it is a more visual medium. So there is more opportunity um, for varying your sort of asset style and to appeal to different learning styles with pictures, with videos. Um, I think both present an opportunity, particularly since acquisitions of, of things like Instagram to sort of, I've had some success with video, video and picture related contests in the past, particularly around user generated content and that won't work for every brand, but that is something that you can do in, in, in collaboration, I mean in tandem with trade shows or differently to try to sort of build up that conversation. Now that is 
usually thought leadership uber light. So it's not like those people are going to submit photos of ideal classroom environments or you know, a picture of your mascot or something that they're going to buy tomorrow, but you are trying to build up mind share in that community in addition to sharing other value-added content throughout the year. Um, so I do think, and there's certainly plenty of studies that show that video converts well. So I think that making sure you sort of vary your asset style um, or you try different things and that you sort of, if you have, if your business is producing content, you have in some ways, and if you don't mind giving some of it away for free, you also have that advantage when it comes to um, Pinterest or just using pictures, period, to steer toward free content that you're giving away to demonstrate the caliber of your content. When you're just selling a SaaS platform, when you're selling a tool that is not necessarily content rich, it's a little harder to tap into the news and trends that would give value added content, not that you can't participate in the general sort of conversation. Mm -hmm. I would say, you know, from my own experience too, if, if you haven't seen what brands like Edutopia um, or Brightbytes or even an organization like ASCD, if you haven't seen what they're doing in social media to engage their audience or their customers or prospective customers or future members, you know, uh, I, would, I would point to them as real standouts. I mean, Edutopia is, uh, has a prolific um, following and, and the quality of the content that they that they share is really pretty amazing. And you don't need to start from scratch. Um, not that you just, that you never want to have original content, but you can come up with people, whether they're individuals or organizations, and whether this is automated or not, that you want to make sure you check out, that you follow, that ideally follow you, or that you share their content. By all means, when you have a small team, don't try to start from scratch. <laughs> um, there's plenty of content sharing and curation you can do, and people will still view you as a sort of leader for doing that. For those who haven't really gotten started with any kind of customer communication, especially in a, using any social channels, um, try to give some guidance in terms of knowing who you're engaging or whether or not to engage first, the concept of listening maybe first, you know, what, and knowing what's important to your audience. And how do you get started? Yeah. Um, so I guess from the Facebook perspective, I think uh, we, one of the great things that's happened over the last, you know, maybe year or so is um, we've really augmented a lot of our search capabilities. So sometimes it can be as simple as doing a little bit of homework about who's out there. And um, when you search for, um, you know, either uh, competitors in your space or other organizations in your space that you think are just based in, in other parts of the industry are, are, um, are doing significant things, you can quickly identify the presence that they have and um, sort of the fan base or network that they've created there. Uh, and then you can sort of follow um, the activity. You can pretty quickly gauge whether they're also taking advantage of presence on Twitter or LinkedIn and, and, and exactly where they're sort of trying to take their entire social ecosystem. And, and you can sort of blatantly follow those game plans on some level. Um, but I also think platforms like Twitter do a great job of giving you a chance to recognize um, not just the sort of the communities built uh, around these brands, but also the intersection with uh, the topics that matter to you, the stories, the information, the um, you know just the the pieces of content that are relevant to your business. And you can when you start to recognize the intersection of high follower bases or um, heavy interaction around uh, tweets or posts, etc., then you can start to I think discern a game plan that might make sense for your business as well. Yeah, just to build off of what Phil said, I think that as you look at people who are very active in the space, who may or may not be your customers, or may be talking about things that are relevant to a solution or service like yours, you can follow these people and cultivate them. And I'd recommend that you cultivate these people not necessarily as customers, but sort of the same way that you might cultivate media or in other industries, analysts. Um, these are people with very large bullhorns, large blog followings or large Twitter followings, um, sometimes large followings on Facebook and in other means, who, if you cultivate a relationship with them, eventually they might be just as beneficial for getting the word out and perhaps cheaper when it comes to new product releases or it comes to evangelizing your product. Um, the other thing I would suggest is looking at your customer base or even your staff and seeing who is very active in social media, not that you don't need rules. Um, in, in, or a plan for sort of how you can engage in social media and when you're the voice of the company and not. But if, for example, your customers, some people in sales or services or some people who are trainers who are out in the schools every day or some customers are already really active, try to tap into that because you might be able to do it for free, you might be able to do it for low cost, or you might be able to co-opt those people to be your company's face of social media um, because that is sort of coming from the field um, and you're agreeing with sort of what they'll talk about, but that is a, a practitioner's perspective that you are sort of trying to tap into um, 
which eventually, maybe they'll come on board eventually, maybe they'll be your CAO eventually, or maybe you'll never get to that point, but it's still using their voice to speak for you, which can be very effective. Not that sales or executives are bad at that, but it can take a lot more work. Talk a little bit more about um, the role of, say, advocates, brand advocates or maybe um, influencers, because I, what I've seen in the education space is that there are a number of educators who have built tremendous following. Some is, you know, their followings are in the hundreds of thousands. Yeah. And getting those folks to notice what a particular education brand is doing and become an advocate for it or potentially, you know, endorsing it. Can you talk a little bit about the power of that or what is the best way to really approach you know, those types of folks online? Um, yeah, so I'll jump in. I think um, the interesting thing in our space is that a lot of the sort of influencer play that um, our clients and brands have taken advantage of has actually moved to the level of uh, scale and arguably like sophistication where there's a sort of an assumption that they're gonna there there may be some real cost involved in uh, engaging uh, those players because they deliver almost their own sort of mass audience within the platforms and so it's it's been really interesting to see that become a, its own cottage industry within the marketing world over the last few years um, and I think it's a for any big organization or even a smaller organization it's the it's the classic sort of ROI conversation about um, is that influencer's audience worth enough to me to essentially sort of lean on the influence versus my own attempts to build content that may tap into those people. And sometimes if the answer is yes, it's because you believe that the influencer is going to reach them more immediately uh, in a cleaner fashion than if you were trying to build your own campaigns and discern the same target audience uh, and create the content yourself. So the other big aspect, I think, is the tone and the manner of how those influencers um, communicate. And if you feel like there's a real level of authenticity and a, um, a genuineness about their um, content and the way they portray themselves to their audience they fe that you feel is well aligned to your organization or your product set, then chances are they could be a really good fit. Uh, to carry your message, but you have to do a little bit of homework, not just about how effectively and consistently they're reaching their constituents or their audiences, but also um, do they exude the sort of personality um, and professionalism and, and sort of knowledge that you feel would be um, a proper representation of your products or your company. I would agree. I think that it's not dissimilar from what a trade magazine might tell a marketing department about why their open rates are better or their third party stamp of approval is better when they're promoting your product or service or content marketing asset. You're looking to spend either nothing or maybe a few hundred or a few thousand dollars to reach these people who I would think of it as like low level celebrity marketing in our space and who these people are is half of them are sort of still practicing educators or teachers or administrators, and half of them aren't. They have their own sort of PD business, evangelist business. Um, and depending on the evolving rules of social media, they have to disclose how endorsing they are <laughs> of the products and services they talk about. But that few hundred or a few thousand dollars could go a lot further to reach their followership, coupled with the tone, than maybe you have to spend on traditional online advertising or other channels. So I think it's an uh, opportunity that a handful of companies I've seen doing in education, I have a few clients talking about it, but not a lot of people have taken advantage of it. So I think it's a real opportunity before it becomes um, popular in some ways to try to tap into it in a space and it's also a lot cheaper than non-education verticals to do so. One of the barriers that uh, I've noticed over the years for companies really in the education space to get started engaging customers or prospects with a social strategy has really been a lack of buy-in sort of at the high level about ROI. Is, is that, has that been your know, show of hands? Has there been resistance at high levels in your organization because they don't, they don't think there's ROI attached to social? Some, okay. Can you guys kind of talk about that, like the metrics around it and how to measure that? What would be effective? Yeah, so um, th that's a subject that has been um, a real point of emphasis within Facebook over the last couple of years because we look at the landscape of um, how and why organizations would choose to partner with Facebook and spend money there. And for a long time, it looked like Facebook was treating um, all their business partners, aka their advertisers, as a second priority to the content on Facebook. And somewhere along the way, I think our organization realized that if we're not fully credible and demonstrate um, that it's a top priority to build products that are in service of a, a client's marketing objectives, then we don't really have a long-term place in, in their marketing mix. And so 
Now we um, are very deliberate when we build new products, not just to be building the kind of products that we have strong confidence are going to drive uh, marketers' objectives, but we're constantly thinking about the measurement of performance and simplifying uh, that sort of process of getting to a clear return on investment measurement uh, for essentially everything that we're um, putting in, in market. And it's had a real impact on even our ability to to maybe challenge uh, the Googles of the world and, and platforms that seemingly have a, a, um, a product that even, it might even be a little bit more um, inherently you know, well-built uh, or well-suited to drive um, consideration and purchase uh, for so many marketers. So I would say that these days in our industry, there's probably more um, different ways to measure performance uh, than there ever has been. And that can also be a bit of an intimidation point. But Fundamentally, as an organization, every, you, you guys have the opportunity now to think very clearly about what you'd hope to get out of using these platforms. And if you do a little bit of digging, you'll find really quickly that there's almost always um, products that are purpose-built for those objectives. And the key is trying to get laser focused on just a, key, a few key objectives and scale your campaigns as, as sort of deliberately and responsibly to focus on those objectives. And we're big believers in encouraging our, our clients and partners to just test and learn their way into bigger scale and greater involvement. So start with something really, really small, like maybe one market, one product, uh, a few weeks of time, a campaign that could be in the hundreds or maybe low thousands of spend, pick one performance objective like um, clicks to a website or something like that, and then um, try to refine your program to the point where you're generating higher and higher returns and then you can start to scale that up and turn around and show those ROI performance stories to senior leadership and sort of earn the right to, to um, increase scale over time. I think that the number of metrics available can be dizzying, but it is also better than other brand building or thought leadership activities where there might be harder to measure metrics or less metrics because that can be scary even if they embrace the idea of social media. I think it is important to embrace a handful of program level metrics um, and to understand the benchmarks too. So don't goal set out in a vacuum somewhere. Um, that will also give you talking points as you kind of regroup about whether a campaign was successful or not. Um, I think you do want to look at followership, fanship, and universe building and how is that number going up, but you shouldn't solely look at that. You do want to look at engagement and reach and traffic, um, and then you do want to look at popularity of content as well, or popularity of likes. So as you think about what content is resonating most in social, it may or may not be what you think it is. And so that could help you determine your editorial content or um, content calendar in the future. Um, it's not bad to look at leads that came in first through social. You steer them to a landing page, you capture their information, maybe eventually they buy or to look at you know, that as one point in the attribution process, if you have an attribution process that sophisticated, but it will not necessarily rain from heaven. You might find in you know, months or years that leads that come through social actually lead to big opportunities. It just takes three years. Um, but looking at the program level metrics in the meantime will help balance out those sort of more funnel related metrics. Yeah, and actually just to build on that, we, we preach to a lot of our clients that all these platforms, whether you focus on one or two individually or think about them collectively, they enable um, organizations to really create a, almost a full funnel experience uh, for their customers. So you can start with very gener uh, broad sort of awareness building messaging, and that can be maybe a little bit more focused on general education, maybe some level of uh, entertainment or engagement. But then there's so many tools available now through platforms like Google and certainly Twitter and Facebook as well, where you can get into very um, promotional or very tactical messaging with a very clear uh, sort of conversion uh, or sale type ROI. And we're, we're big believers that every organization should be trying to do a little bit of that sort of all, all the time and sort of work to build uh, a, a cycle or a cadence that allows them to be constantly replenishing that upper funnel and building leads and creating engagement and then um, some level of activity that is working a little harder to drive uh, product sales and conversions and, and uh, build traffic on your sites. Um, because you never know what your, you'll ultimately learn a little bit more about what your long-term sales cycle looks like. I, I think that's a good point. I would just say, obviously, there's half of us in here that might have parent or school-level yeah. sales or teacher-level sales, where you Six can months. afford to be more salesy and more consumery online, where you might have Christmas specials, where there might be back-to-school specials. And then those same companies or others are trying to build thought leadership for larger sales that take three months to three years. And sometimes you might be doing a little bit of both. So it's not that you... I know I said salesy is bad earlier. I think that if you have a more consumer-oriented product, a consumer-oriented purchase, 
that mirrors consumer buying habits, you can afford to be more salesy. I would highly recommend balancing that with the sort of thought leadership activities yeah. that Phil was saying. Yeah, that's right. Um, I'd like to change the conversation and talk a little bit about um, executive participation in social media. I mean, we're so fortunate to work, I know this is preaching to the choir, but very fortunate to work in a space where we can be really passionate and proud of the work that we, that we do every day, helping teachers teach and students learn. Um, it's great to see team members, of whether it's the marketing team, the sales team, start to participate in engaging customers. But there's something to really be said about the highest level executive or executives on a team um, really embracing social media and, and doing it not just to talk about what their product does, not being salesy, as you said, mm -hmm. but to really engage them and say, you know, tell us about what happened in the classroom. How, do, how are your students engaged? Um, you know, just engaging. Let's just talk about that a little bit, about executive participation. Yeah, so, you know, we see so many... Um, Again, I work with some large organizations, so sometimes for them the challenge is they, they allow themselves to get a little caught up in the responsibilities of being uh, part of a publicly traded company maybe, and they, um, a lot of times they might think about the, the potential backlash that exists in, in sort of communicating directly in social and being the, the voice or the mouthpiece for an organization. But, um, you know, more than not, we encourage our clients not to... Um, you, you can't spend all your energy trying to protect and, and um, sort of prevent against things that are out of your control because the social space is a bit of a wild west. It, it's certainly true in terms of how many people can sort of uh, read or sort of take in content and provide commentary that may not be flattering or um, what everybody wants to see and hear, but that cannot um, prevent people from uh, wanting to, you know, put out their message in the most straightforward and authentic way possible. And I think to your point that when a, a senior leader within an organization has an opportunity to speak, uh, you know, in a very passionate way about what they believe in and what their organization is doing, it does speak volumes about the, um, the, you know, the core charter of that particular organization. And it, it, it really breaks through. In a lot of ways, we see it generates really strong levels of engagement. And so... Um, uh, I think it's really just about recognizing um, the moments when that is going to feel more appropriate than um, maybe sort of run of business activity and um, create a comfort level within the organization that um, those forums are really powerful ways to get those messages heard and scaled up effectively. Um, and, and really the biggest thing is not allow any sort of potential backlash out there to um, intimidate anybody from, from taking advantage of that platform. I haven't seen a lot of companies do it well in this space. Mm -hmm. um, I think that there's a real opportunity. In some ways, it's um, if you have a smaller business that's just starting where the founder might be active in social, um, even though they're spread way too thin, they sort of might get it already, the right. inherent value there. And then keeping that or figuring out how to scale that as it grows, um, hopefully carving out that time for them. I have found it to be um, an exciting but uphill battle to try to educate executives about the value of it or sort of put parameters around the types of stuff they should tweet because yeah. it's, it's tricky to understand, um, although it's important to humanize them and can be really beneficial. Um, I feel like sometimes they're a little consumed with the running of the business, yeah. so, which, which makes sense, or high on the business even if they like customer feedback. Mm -hmm. So I think that, um, I don't think it's sort of evangelists or bust, but sometimes if you're looking at trainers or services or uh, people that are more in the field with the teachers, sometimes they could be a better voice to start with. Um, and, and maybe that grows into executives over time. I've also had executives that are willing but wanted to approve every tweet before it was sent, <laughs> right. um, which is just not the way 140 characters works <laughs> right. in a priority way. Um, so it, it, there was sort of a willingness to contribute but not an understanding of how the media w medium worked. Right. Um, I do think that Ghostwriting or ghostwriting with initials when they decide to contribute is okay. Mm -hmm. um, at least it's better than them not being out there at all. Okay. Yeah, and actually, just two things to build on that. I completely agree about the notion of humanizing the voice when possible. If, if, if there's an opportunity to make an executive group or an individual feel more accessible to his or her uh, constituents, I think sometimes social can be a great place to do that. And sometimes the immediacy of a platform like Twitter is particularly good for that because it sort of allows everything to feel uh, a little bit more off the cuff, a little more conversational. Um, and then that point you made toward the end about um, people's sort of innate sort of want to control a little bit and, and approve content, 
the other great thing about social is just how dynamic it is, and people should sort of embrace the fact that it's constantly changing, and a, a, a tweet that you'll post now will be gone by virtue of sort of being covered by more content in another you know, hour or two. And so it's getting people to sort of recognize the immediacy and sort of the dynamic nature of it and to uh, really embrace it and take advantage of it rather than to be sort of intimidated by it because organizations that aren't willing to sort of build their content in a nimble way and, and kind of uh, try and stay at that pace are probably not going to feel like their message is landing quite as well. I think when executives in this space do... Um, sort of take that leap of faith and put themselves out there. I think mostly the results are, are, are really positive, especially, especially if they're very genuine and they're not just talking about, again, their product or their brand. But taking that a step further now, getting buy-in from the rest of the organization, if you have an executive that's really leading the way, um, doing a great job, um, you know, spreading that throughout the organization and maybe this also attaching this concept that everyone can be customer service. Everyone in your organization can communicate with the customer and really improve engagement. Talk about that concept a little bit. <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I, I mean, I think the spirit of what you're saying is exactly right. I think the challenge is operationalizing that can sometimes be um, a, a little bit difficult because uh, it, it just, every organization is going to structure their handles differently and their sort of rules around content development and moderation um, differently. Um, and I think it's really important to have at least a working team that centralizes the activity to some degree or puts some rules around um, who can moderate, how they can moderate, how they can engage. Um, and, and scale is a big part of it too. If you're an organization that expects to be engaging 3,000 customers on a daily basis through social channels, then I think a greater level of centralization is important. If it's maybe 50 to a few hundred, um, then I think there's the opportunity to probably be a little bit more um, loose with it and maybe encourage a wider distribution of, uh, of players uh, contributing to the conversation. But uh, behind the scenes, uh, I've, we've seen so many organizations become really successful at refining their content strategy by crowdsourcing internally with their employees, um, not just the kind of content that makes sense for the space, but their approach to um, articulating the content or expressing the content and then bringing in new ideas from employees about things they've seen in other platforms and really taking advantage of trends and best practices and shaping the um, go-to-market approach behind the scenes. I think there is also an opportunity to expand distribution. It just needs, a, um, by leveraging your employees, it just needs a little bit of spelling out for them in terms of, um, like I've seen some, on 24, which is you know a webinar provider, um, if you look at their salespeople's LinkedIn profiles, there are keywords that the marketing team has told them to include there, but they're consistent and it reinforces the corporate message. Um, and I think that if you explain to people simply, especially if you have executive buy-in, you know, what what they could do when we share content, they could retweet every day, they could retweet every other day, they could um, share it themselves directly, whether it's through a sort of professional account or their own personal account. That can really help get your, uh, sort of exponentialize your reach a little bit internally because you're leveraging these 50 to 500 or more people, that, or 10 people that work with you to kind of get the word out. Um, and it's, and sometimes it's easier to have people start that when they're not already active in social and they're not afraid of what's on their Facebook page necessarily. But if they can just basically share your content or steer the content you're sharing, um, especially if they're in the market and networking with educators, it really can help expand your reach a little bit um, with not a lot of effort. It's just sort of a one, two, three guide for them. And I, in my experience, again, in the education space, I would highly encourage everyone in the room, if you don't have your own social policies in place for customer communication, to get them in place. But focus on not telling them what they cannot do don't make it a negative thing. Tell them the types of things that you want them to do um, and how to avoid sort of the canned responses uh, so it looks like, you know, they're talking to a robot or something. You know, have people really understand empathy. Um, and really, to a greater point, uh, what I would tell everyone or encourage you to, to talk to your teams about or if you're going to engage on your own um, is the importance of authenticity. Um, educators can smell a rat <laughs> pretty fast. And they know when you're just pitching them. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've, I've seen educators complain or actually tell me about other brands that they've interacted with who really offended them because they would say things to them like, well, my product's going to make you a better teacher. Yeah, I hear you. <laughs> Imagine walking up to an educator and telling them that to their face. 
I, I've got a product that'll make you a better educator. And what do you think that educator's thinking? Well, first thing is they might actually ask you, well, how many years were you in the classroom, right? So authenticity is absolutely critical. And I'd love to get your opinion about this before we move to some questions from the group. But um, just a real quick, as a resource, uh, how many in here are familiar with Richard Byrne? He's a blogger. He has a blog called Free Tech for Teachers. OK, show of hands. Um, if you go to the website edcircuit.com and just search for um, a column that he wrote on that website, um, I think it's called Ed Tech Companies Stop Talking Down to Teachers. I think it's a tremendous resource for brands. Um, he is an educator. Um, he's, he's asked to speak around the world. Uh, he's a Google certified teacher, but he has a blog that's visited by over a million educators a month. And he really has had just about every one of you in this room probably pitch him at one point. But what he's really encouraging you to do is be real. And if you're going to engage your audience, you know, the word of caution is know the language. Know something about pedagogy. Um, do your homework. So yeah. I'd really love to hear your opinions on that. And then we're going to take some questions. Yeah, yeah. I think um, I'm a little less steeped in the education space specifically. But I think that it's all about bringing value. I mean, we're big believers that all these channels are um, they're so highly active and there's so much competition for the, uh, for the sort of real estate to put your content there and the number of users have sort of constrained time to to be on these platforms looking for information that matters to them and so you always want to use the filter of am I delivering value to my audiences am I making them better smarter happier etc um, and then to your point about the kind of conversation you'd have and even thinking about your sort of expression is if you were in a live conversation with somebody, would you talk that exactly. way? And, and if it feels false to you as you're building it into a, a tweet or a post, then it's probably not gonna be the, the sort of um, stance or, or uh, aesthetic that you wanna sort of uh, you know, carry there. I think it's a chance to take a step back and strip it down a little bit, make it more straightforward, make it uh, feel more genuine, um, always try and make it less complicated, less uh, salesy if at all possible. Yeah, I think that um, making sure that you have assets that you can share. If you think about the stuff that people like HubSpot or Marketo throw at all of us every day, some of that you can take away even if you don't use their platform and get value out of that. So whether it's giving away content or giving away tips and tricks or giving away PD, this is the type of stuff people are looking for, ideally with some remotely tangential connection to what you do so that when finally they are ready to engage with a solution or service like yours, they do think of you. I think there's the ability to just participate in the general education policy, ed tech sort of conversation on Twitter to kind of be part of that world, whether it's a hashtag chat or whether it's just sort of engaging in the news and trends. That will help sort of make sure that you kind of know what's going on that has direct and indirect implications to your business. Um, and I was going to say something else that I completely forget, so I'll stop well, there. Well, I'll let you think about it. <laughs> yeah. You mentioned um, Twitter chats. How many in here have ever participated in education-related Twitter chats? OK, a handful of you. How many of you, when you jumped in, were you on the ed chat chats, which is probably the biggest one in education? OK, a few more of you. Um, I think they're outstanding. Uh, happen to know some of the folks that actually started those chats. Um, Steve Anderson, Tom Whitby, and a few others. Some of you may know them. Um, you know, very generous guys uh, with their time and their advice. However, at the same time, word of caution. Uh, do not jump into a Twitter chat that's focused on serving educators and start talking about your product. Like, oh, you have a problem with, uh, you know, disruptive kids, use this product and it's going to solve all your problems. They will tune you out in a heartbeat, if not complain that, you know, you're intruding on their space. So again, you know, know the language. Um, get to know what they value, and if you really understand education, many people who are in this business have education backgrounds, talk like another educator, and just enjoy the conversation, and eventually it may turn into a conversation about what you do, and what your product could potentially offer them. So. Did you want to have a follow-up on that? Yeah, no, I would say, and I can't remember, it's somewhere in my Twitter feed, there's like this awesome list of like 50 or 100 of them, like more than you ever yeah, think um, exist. I know we actually started one at Solution Tree because we were looking for another channel to push our authors out through, and we actually rotated the authors through moderating it to make sure that it wasn't too salesy. Um, I don't think you need to start your own unless you have it sort of as, as much of a niche. I think tapping into existing ones, maybe getting your customers or um, former educators on your staff to moderate or help with that or mm -hmm. contribute it could be a really good way to go. But it's an awesome 
hour of PD in 140 characters or less that um, is really awesome to follow. If you haven't followed one, I encourage you to try it. I'd just take that a little step further in talking about how to, to get the proper resources for engaging customers or participating in these types of chats. Um, I found that some of the, on my staff, some of the most success I had was when I took people with you know, journalism backgrounds who could really write were great with you know expressing themselves in, in the written word and having them really function as part of the social team and then having them constantly be trained or engaged with the folks on our editorial staff who were creating product if you have those people engaging with each other the chances are that the person that's going to be handling your social uh, channels is, is going to say the right things you know the right terminology and, and appear as I said before authentic yeah. One last word on that. I remember what I was going to say. Um, I think it's okay to be human. There's a, I mean, there's presentations you'll hear where it's you know 80% professional, 20% um, personal. Um, it's okay to say happy birthday to people. It's okay to be a little tongue in cheek sometimes. It's okay to thank people for following you. It's okay to share other news and trends beyond education. And I think that adds to the authenticity. You don't want to be offensive. You don't want to be completely random. You still want to be part of that thought leadership conversation, but you don't want to be a robot, even if you're programming all of that. <laughs> Um, yeah. Just one last question, and then I'm going to ask you guys to please you know, share your questions or your thoughts or su success stories. Um, talk about briefly, how do you deal with sort of the naysayers uh, that may complain about your brand? You know, customer engagement isn't all just you know, wine and roses. So <laughs> what, do we, what do we do? What are some best practices if you have somebody complaining about your brand? Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good one. I spent uh, a good part of my career most recently uh, on the agency side working with uh, AT&T, so uh, it's hard to get a, a company that's less uh, or more disliked than, than any of the big telcos. And um, I, I think the simple answer is that the, the space where they were most successful in, in social is engaging people about things that they genuinely um, get excited about, get passionate about. So um, we did a lot of work with their, um, the division that does UVerse and their television product. And so when you get people talking about entertainment and content that they look forward to engaging when, they're, when it's free time, when it's play time, you, you sometimes sort of uh, soften or obfuscate some of the frustrations. Doesn't mean that it doesn't also quickly turn into a conversation about, oh yeah, well while we're on the subject of UVerse, my service went out three weeks ago and you haven't come to fix that. Um, but when brands have been most successful in sort of um, blunting that sort of criticism is um, being uh, genuine and consistent in how they approach every customer, um, trying to take those conversations sort of out of the social space if they can and turn it into one-on-one -on -one dialogue so that it doesn't sort of cloud uh, other conversation that's happening. And um, to the extent possible, like trying to have an, a sort of even hand about how they treat every customer, not just the ones that are sort of the most flagrant, but even ones with a mild issue. So highly responsive and highly consistent in how they approach it. Yeah, and it's public, so you want to appear, you want to be responsive and appear responsive. Mm -hmm. um, I know there's times that I've tweeted at companies when customer service has been unresponsive. So I think if you're managing your social accounts directly, if you're involving services, or if someone else is managing them, no one to escalate to you so that you can be responsive and no one to take it offline, which can be hard to track down information sometimes. Mm -hmm. But you also want to, for the public record, appear responsive to service issues because, God forbid, anyone has them. They want to know that you are reacting the right way. Yeah. Um, I also think there's an opportunity through some... I was talking to someone this morning about reviews, which is really interesting. Whether it's on... If you think about the way we all shop for things, there's a lot of retailers that do just put things, good, bad, and ugly, on yes. their websites. And you can decide to hide some of that or not, or pay Yelp enough to hide your negative reviews or not. Mm -hmm. But um, I think there's an opportunity. There's not really a common medium. Um, there's some, obviously, education social networks. There's some commenting functionality um, or reviewing functionality on, on LinkedIn or Facebook. Yeah. But there's also, you could just add it to your website. You know, it's not just the quote that you have five of that you rotate through a library or a case study, but let people offer feedback. They might actually be useful for product development or they might be raving fans that, you, that are not your usual suspects that you could identify for the future. Excellent. Um, it's your turn. We'd love to hear from you. Um, just raise your hand. I have a mic. I'll come over to you if you have questions or you want to share a success story. One brave person. There you go. Um, Should be on. You uh, were talking a little bit about influencers and kind of leveraging them and using them. Um, one of the things that um, I discovered was in utilizing influencers, they other people are also utilizing them. Um, and so how do you cut through the noise when they're also promoting um, other products and services potentially that compete with yours? Great question. Thank you. That's a great question. So uh, 
I think that's about due diligence up front uh, to the extent that you can sort of vet um, their track record of the depth of sort of uh, marketing engagements they've taken on over the last few years. Um, and you should be able to have honest conversations with their representatives in advance about, well, how many other programs sort of before and after are they going to also be uh, engaging with. Um, and you can also do a little homework from their follower base about whether that, um, w whether people are already starting to become uh, a little desensitized to their message by virtue of feeling like those people are constantly promoting or, or, or pitching. Um, uh, and it's a bit of a tricky one, and, but ultimately if you get to the point where you're close to engaging with somebody, there is an opportunity to build contract language about trying to create an exclusive arrangement. And I would certainly encourage, uh, the minute you get into a big, significant sort of marketing investment, you have every right to say, for the next six months, I, I want this to be the only product that you're going to talk about in this space so that we don't sort of run into that fatigue. I think it's fair to ask about that and ask sort of what the time leading up to that was like. Yeah. Um, I think it's also, I wouldn't panic about it, but you don't want to be negligent about it. If you think about the trade magazines that do email blasts that all of us get every day, um, they, you know, times five to ten. <laughs> They are, there's multiple LMSs, there's multiple SISs, there's multiple student privacy solutions. So I don't know that it will hurt at the end of the day. Um, but especially when you have that personal connection with these people before they're rich and famous, right. just trying to get them to be honest or sort of give you that grace period I think could be helpful. Yeah, the, the irony is the, the bigger they get, the bigger the follower, the stakes get higher. And of course your investment gets bigger, so it's even more important at that point to make sure that your message is going to be treated specially by those people. But, and, and then the other responsibility you have is to recognize that you may have an engagement with them for six months, but they may do something in a year's time in terms of how they represent themselves or another product or a brand that may ultimately still be associated with you and your business. So that's another reason to really tread carefully. You just want to feel like you have a, a great uh, sense about the, that individual or their organization in terms of how they portray themselves and how they engage with products so you have a high comfort level that yours will be treated well. I would say that in my experience as well, um, in engaging influencers, uh, it wasn't just, you know, we were asking them to talk about our product in, in um, social channels. We found that sometimes on their own, they would talk about us at trade shows, in keynotes, and we weren't paying them for that. Now, a lot of them have really gotten smart about that and are charging for that too. But I, I highly encourage you to try to engage as many influencers as you can. They're not all going to be great fits. It's almost like dating. You know, you have to find out if, if it's a good fit. You know, is there a good relationship here? Do they value the same things that you value and what your, your product really professes to do? Um, but I, I can't encourage you enough because they can be, you know, sort of that champion for you in engaging prospective customers or current customers. You know, sort of birds of, a, of the feather, right? Um, so I encourage you. But anyone else? Anyone want to share? Um, we've got about five more minutes. A question or a success story? Please. I've got a question of um, how do you turn somebody that's a private kind of evangelist, your, your customer base, that really likes your service, your company, however, because they're part of education, they're a government employee, and they give the feedback of, you know, in a very large setting, public setting, I don't. I can't put my name on that, you know, because it would be underwriting something commercial. I think it, um, I've certainly run into, even with things like case studies, you know, so, you know, the, the not as sort of um, endorsing of what you might want all your raving fans to do in multimedia, but um, I've run into districts where you just, it doesn't work, and sometimes it doesn't work with your raving fans, but not every district has those same policies. Um, the pushback when it doesn't work is often when there's some type of compensation involved or some type of honorarium. They're unwilling or unable to take it. Um, but oftentimes you can find someone that is, or maybe you can push those people into the channels like webinars, which can still even be hairy, if you're just talking about the impact of your product. Um, but it's much more customer-centric, um, much more sort of peer-centric. You're not asking them to sort of be the face in an ad campaign or something like that. Um, but I've certainly run into people that I couldn't use because there was no way around it with district policy. So I look for others. We have time for maybe one more question. Anyone else? Maybe this side of the room. Anyone? How about a, su a success story that you have? Anyone have anything they want to share? Oh, okay. This side of the room let me down. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm happy to take this uh, opportunity to share about our app. You know, we are a new uh, startup, and I think everything that uh, you mentioned is what we have been focused last six months. Uh, we started with uh, probably our first presence at a convention, but then very quickly we realized that 
uh, the social is where um, uh, the word gets out much faster and much uh, easier. Um, and what we also did was to focus on the teachers embracing our app. So obviously it's a natural fit for teachers to talk about our app. Just very quickly, what we do is uh, it's like a mini Facebook for your class communication between the teachers and the parents. Uh, particularly, you know, as parents and teachers, we live in a world where everything is social and mobile, except when it comes to how teachers engage with the parents. So that's the problem we're trying to solve, and I think it's a natural fit for what we try to do to talk and use the social channels. And um, I'm happy to share that, you know, in the last uh, two and a half months, we have grown probably 100 times, uh, just uh, with the word of mouth, and, um, you know, people... Almost now we have probably 50 uh, blogs written by teachers loving about our app. So check us out, uh, blooms.net. Thank you. Congratulations. Yeah, thanks for sharing. Well, please join me in thanking um, Phil and Paul for their insights. Uh, really appreciate your time. And our contact information is up here. We're, you know, if we didn't get to your question or something comes up, please engage us. Just jot down our email addresses or websites or Twitter handles.